thank you for coming back to class on a day after a stormy Nashville event. Um, today we are going, we're up to lecture four, channel your inner seven-year-old, because today we are going to talk about gifts and we're going to talk about parties. So the exciting part of ceremonial around weddings in particular. So as per regular class format, you know the drill. If you would buddy up with somebody, I would like you to take just a few minutes to talk through the sort of philosophical questions. What do gifts do? What do they mean? How do they function? What is a gift and why does it matter? And then I'd like you to take a couple minutes and talk about whether or not you think there are ways in which wedding gifts are different. So we'd like you to have just a few minutes to think through that um, with your partner, and then we'll move back up to front and talk about it as a group. <clears throat> So I hear some interesting strands emerging, and I want to be sure I have a chance to show you some dance videos later, um, because dancing is cool. Um, so I'm going to bring you back up front, even though you could spend probably the whole of our time today talking about gifts and their meaning, because it's complicated, right? Tell me something about gifts and their functions. And uh, this time, I'll start on this side of the room, because I usually start over there. Tell me something about gifts. Well, they give someone delight. That's channeling that inner seven-year-old, right? A gift is something that is going to provide you with a moment of emotional like uh, recognition because you are getting something, in a sense, something for nothing, or is it really for nothing? Something else. My favorite gift is, my last name is Nickel, so I buy, buy a vase at a garage sale, and I put nickel in it for wedding gifts, and they love it. Oh, that's lovely. So a gift can be something that has meaning and that forges connection, a shared understanding of what the gift is actually representing in that moment and in the future. To curry favor, one gives a gift because you want something out of it. Um, and uh, as we've seen, sometimes in a musical sphere, you give the gift of music in the hopes of getting that Mozartian snuff box or other benefit to make the giver look good. So we all know that there's that moment when you get an invitation where you have to decide where you want to rank in that pecking order, right? Because a gift is a status object, and a gift will be read by all of the people in the community as a statement both about your relationship to the person receiving and about your standing in the community at large. There's nothing like a cheap gift to make somebody look bad. <laughs> Something else about gifts. It's a token. It's, you're acknowledging a milestone or a kind of It's a marker of sorts, and so it serves a signaling function, and it actually helps us define where we are in a sort of pattern of social relationships over time. A gift the first time you're dating that's a deep moment, right? Do you like that person enough to get them a gift? Doesn't matter which way the gift is going, that moment of signaling is profoundly meaningful. It moves you to a new stage of the relationship. It is a symbol of something special. Keep going, this is fun. Other things about gifts. It can be something that you need, so it can, fulfill, it can fill a gap. It can be a way of providing um, the excess from one area to the need in another area. And I hope you'll remember that because our last lecture in the 18th century goes to that very much. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question about what you do when you've got more wealth than you know what to do with, um, and at some level, some of the gifts that we see in the 16th century wind up being a form of conspicuous uh, consumption. Um, and so there is an aspect to giving 
that is more rhetorical than meaningful. Um, it is more an assertion of identity than uh, actual relationship building moment. Well, I think I've actually got an example of that that we'll muse on for a little bit. So talk to me a little bit about um, distinguishing moments that make a wedding gift different. Like what is it about a wedding gift that makes it different? Right. Right? So wedding gifts uh, are often meant to be something that will be visually present in the person's life as they go forward, but useful in a ceremonial way. Think about that silver platter that's at the very back of your cabinet, right? I think everyone owns one, and you haven't polished it in a decade. Yeah, that would be me. Um, so it is lovely, and I have been known to pull it out for parties. So I use it. It's a useful gift. Oh my gosh, it made me look like an adult. And it is part of my household inheritance. And it is something that is really meaningful on those three occasions. I've used it so far in my life and we all have one of those. And it is true from what we see in inventories that when women particularly got gifts in a wedding context, that those very often went into the chest where her worldly goods were being housed. Um, and it may have some of the same function as the back of my kitchen cabinet. We don't always see a lot of evidence for regular usage. It becomes the special object, the token that at that moment there was some something really unique and signaling about this, and then when it comes time and the husband is dead, then you find that there are visits to the pawn shop, and all of a sudden there's money in the household, so it also becomes a form of currency. And that can be for a variety of wedding gifts. We tend, at least I, tend to think about gifts as being things like uh, silver or ceramic or the household uh, sort of plate or um, the uh, beautiful vase or the painting, uh, but it also extends into things like books and candlesticks. And that's where our pawn shop records really do indicate that it may have had a signaling effect, but it was not something that, and it was usually she because women, if they didn't die in childbirth, tended to live longer and get married to older husbands, she would then use the funds from the pawn shop in order to do a variety of things. I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to tell a story about one of the medieval manuscripts that I love so much. So way back in the 12th century, there were some really ornate polyphony going on in Paris. And we've talked about how special polyphony was, like that ooh moment. Well, this was great stuff, and it was put together in a book that they called the Magnus Liber, the Great Book of Organum. And one of the copies that was made over the, like, 50 years that the repertoire was active, um, it lives in Wolfenbüttel, Wolfenbüttel uh, in the library, where it is called W2 for Wolfenbüttel, the second manuscript, because we're musicologists and we're weird. Um, so W2 is a manuscript copied probably in the late 12th or 13th century. It's about yay thick. It's Latin. It's church pieces written out in elaborate polyphony. Very cool. Well, that form of writing was popular for a period about 50 years, which is about as long as the repertoire survives. Coincidence? I think not. So by the time you get to the 14th century, there's this really, really thick stack of parchment with stuff in it. And the stuff is undecipherable and Latin. So it sits around for a while, and time passes. And then one of the great book collectors of the 16th century comes trotting through and says, oh, look at this cool Latin book. I want it. And so he makes arrangements to acquire it, and he takes it back home, and he presents it as a gift to his wife, who I'm sure was thinking, great, I've got stuff that looks like chickens walked on my page in Latin. <coughs> so he lives for about another 12 years, 
And he transcribes a few of those Latin texts. Gifts, gifts are transitory. I give it to you so that I can use it. Oh, yes. How many of you have ever received a useful household tool? Yeah. Um, and so there are some transcriptions that come out of W2 that her husband puts together. And then he dies. And there she is at the pawn shop with what we now consider to be one of the great collections of Western art music, trading it in for some coin so that she can move her household to another city. So the book to her is not a memory of her husband. It is not a useful object. It is an investment in the future that she is choosing for herself now that her husband is no longer with her. And so um, it becomes that object of exchange. So gifts, they can have many functions. Other aspects, sorry, that was a long story, but I think it's a fun one because I think it tells you something about how we think about gifts in the moment versus what they mean over the course of a life. So a couple more things about wedding gifts. Tell me something more about wedding gifts. I think that, <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that investment in the identity of the giver and the givee is something we are going to talk a lot about today because gifts are, again, back to that signaling function. And wedding gifts are signaling not just the individual, but they're signaling the relationship of the couple one to another. So we're going to talk about that as well. Um, last observations about wedding gifts. Here's the place for the cash card, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we think of that as really being new. Remind us all of that story when we get to the last lecture and talk about the 18th century, because there are a lot of things you can do with coin that you can't do so readily with those meaningful hand-built wedding gifts that come into your portfolio. So the last thing I'd like to talk just a couple minutes about is that the 16th century is a period of gift giving in extraordinary ways. And one of the things, studies of Elizabeth's court, uh, Queen Elizabeth, had a culture at court in which gifts are given sort of round-robin fashion. I give a gift to you, you give a gift to her, she gives a gift to him, he gives a gift to you, you give a gift to me, and everybody's happy. Um, and it is usually there's some change of object along the way, but they become sort of ways of stitching together networks. And what's interesting is that the things that are given can be things like a single pearl in earring or a little miniature portrait, or lace for the collar, or clothing that has been bespoke, that's been um, developed for the particular individual, or it can be a poem, or it can be a song. But the process of giving becomes one of the ways that you negotiate status at court. Was your gift at the right level? Did you know how to present it? Did you make sure that the gift was given in a private moment, but with the ability for the person to talk about it in the future? Did you write a sonnet to accompany your gift? It becomes a way of performing courtliness. Likewise, in uh, this period, particularly in England, the gift of the miniature was a really important part of that, that sort of time ramp of the wedding, um, you often, the first gift that wasn't, it wasn't a gift in the sense of the wed, but was the first gift to signal the relationship, would be the portrait of the individual. And we all know this, right? Uh, he saw the portrait and he fell in love with her and then they got married and lived happily ever afterwards. We know those stories, but we tend to forget that that's actually a real picture. And that sometimes those pictures are really a keen way of identifying the future beloved <clears throat> because they haven't met before. And sometimes those portraits are really lovely representations 
of individuals who are maybe not quite so lovely if we were to use a photographic reproduction of the individual. So we do have a few court cases, um, me and my court cases. We do have a few court cases which say, yes, I know that we went through the sort of betrothal ceremony, but then she showed up and she's really ugly. <laughs> and so that question about the verisimilitude of these little miniature portraits or of the um, cameos that become popular in this period become part of the narrative of these wedding gifts because they're supposed to be representational and they're supposed to flatter the individual being depicted but they're supposed to be true enough to life that you can make a contract on the basis of the picture being given. So uh, wedding gifts are part and parcel of the process that we've been talking about. I'm going to talk for the first half today about some of the musical gifting that goes on um, with a few asides into some non-musical gifts. And then the second half, we're just going to turn over to the party part um, and talk about peasant culture a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so I mentioned last time that romances are a really rich space to learn all kinds of things about this timeline of wedding uh, from the moment of making the decision through betrothal, through marriage, and then into bedding. And so one of the things that we see a lot in these romances are these stories of the betrothal gift. And I mentioned last time we musicologists have always said, oh, look, it's a wedding piece. It must be for the wedding day. But in fact, the ceremonies were often at that point of departure, the betrothal and then the procession to the groom's home were the moments at which the gifts would be really meaningful. Because from a woman's point of view, you're leaving behind everything you know. You may be going to a place where you don't even speak the language. So the gift is meant to accompany you and provide solace on your journey. So it's both to be sort of an exciting look, you get cool things because you're getting married, and also a sort of signal of this moment of change. We talked about this sort of gift as an articulation. She has moved from being usually the unmarried child of an identified parent into the status of being the betrothed of an identified future spouse. And so her identity has shifted allegiance in that betrothal moment. That's interesting. Um, another little side story, um, 16th century. You have to stop me when I get too far off base. There was once the daughter of a Florentine notary. <clears throat> her name was Marietta. We know that because she got a gift of a songbook. In her songbook, the first eight pieces spell out Marietta, M, A, R, R, I, E, T, T, A. Each piece in the book for the first date runs through her name. <clears throat> she identifies herself. She signs the book. She signs it twice. She identifies herself as the daughter of a Florentine notary so that we know that she's in that sort of bureaucratic mercantile class, that she's well-to-do, that she is probably around 14 because um, in Florence, uh, young women were getting married in the 15 to 16 year old age. So she's a teenager, but she's a young teenager. And <clears throat> she got a songbook. And that's really cool. It is also one of the early songbooks that include pieces that are not in French. Because the, in the 15th century, the Italians were all about the French repertoire. This is an early 16th century book. And she just loves her some Italian stuff, because I assume she understands it better. The other thing that makes this particular gift really interesting is that several of the songs, including the first one, are among the most obscene songs of the 16th century. <laughs> Which is interesting if you think about giving a 14-year-old an obscene song that starts with the letter M as the first song in her songbook. The very first song is actually a Dutch one which is a reference to all of the um, wars that have been going on. So you have a number of knights who have been commissioned from the Dutch areas who have been down in Italy fighting all of those Italian wars at the start of the 16th century. Um, the very first song is asking her how she feels. The more, mo <clears throat> sorry, 
asking her how she feels the morning after she first had intercourse. But it does so with really crass questions. And so the first song in this lovely songbook in which the first letter is gold to signal her identity is about the bedding ceremony. That's weird. And I love that example because we know that the book was created for her. It spells out her name. And it tells us something about the way in which they're thinking about the repertoire. It reminds me of that stuff on the radio that I won't let my kids listen to in the car. Teens across time loved themselves some <coughs> edgy repertoire. And there, somebody copied it for her. So Marietta's songbook, um, which was copied probably around 1515. So there's an example. In that process of betrothal, then, you might get a gift. And we know enough about rings. We talked in that first lecture. Rings are really more a uh, 16th century phenomenon than an earlier phenomenon, but they could be a wed. They could be, we saw enough examples. Remember the medieval donut, um, right, like this big around going onto the finger. That's just weird. What's odd about the rings that we see in these romances is you never get a diamond. Diamonds are not the girl's best friend. Diamonds are actually not really part of this repertoire. Instead, it's the lovely deep red that we talk about. Oh, it's a beautiful ring with lovely deep red, or the dark red of garnet, or the light red of pale ruby, or the green of emerald, as if it were like the countryside. Colored stones as gifts. Uh, and colored stones in setting are a lovely betrothal gift if you're at a certain class. And so that's one of the things, the fresh earthen newness, I love that phrase, uh, the fresh earthen newness of my emerald. Um, so they're using jewels and they're giving jewels as part of this way of establishing these moments of transition. The other thing that we get testament to in these romances um, and I mean romances in terms of the novel-length poem written in reverse form, uh, which usually feature knights, chivalry, young maidens, um, and occasionally in the genre you get the dragons, um, but more often you get knights fighting tournaments uh, and lovely descriptions of feasts and birds and forests. Romances are big into lists, which is how we get so many details about the kinds of rings there are. Um, so the other kind of wed that shows up is the gift of a banner. And that banner is usually worked in gold, so it's brocade. It's usually something silk with silver and gold thread, and it might have jewels on it. You can use pearls. And so these descriptions of cloth, and I am not a textile person, so that's the point at which my eyes roll back into my head, but I want you to remember today that a gift of a really elaborate banner can be one of the gifts you give at the betrothal ceremony. Why is that? Because again, your uh, embroidered, elaborate fabric banner is a signal of identity and you can use it on display. You can put it on the wall. It's like, uh, it's like nowadays you'd go to Kinko's and you'd get one of those lovely posters and you'd have something that's like a wow moment. So think of these banners as being the wow moment in a 16th century context. You will also sometimes get full-blown tapestries. Um, tapestries are practical gifts. Pa tapestries help to keep your walls warm. And remember, this is still the period where that little ice age is going on. It is cold in Europe at this time, so fabric is a good gift to give. So let's talk a little bit about gifts to my wife. I've culled just a few of these. Um, so going back to the 14th century, we were talking a lot last time about Italy and the kind of gift culture in Italy. So in, according to our friend Juris Ubaldus of Perugia, the husband is giving, typically, gifts of clothes and accessories. And those gifts are in order for her to appear in public proudly and honorably. Why would a husband want to give the wife something that she can wear? Because when she wears it, she's presumably moving up a visual status level, and you are getting some credit for this gift that you have supposedly given away. So he gets the benefit out of it, 
and she gets something to wear. So that is our kind of legal context. It's to increase her honor. Uh huh. Um, studies of nuptial gifts and of these ceremonies suggest that it really needed to be both ways. He is going to give her something, she is going to give him something. And so um, Christine Kapesh Zuber has talked about the um, obligatory compulsory reciprocity that if you're going to receive a betrothal gift, you have to be prepared to give a betrothal gift. So a gift is not a neutral function. You don't just get it and say thank you. You have to give another gift in kind. We also talked last time, once you've established how much goes in at the betrothal moment, if you bake break the betrothal, you owe them four times what you put down as your first pledge. So uh, yeah, you want to be careful about how ornate that gift winds up being. And this is where we start getting those, um, those long descriptions of what those gifts look like. Gemstones, again back to our gemstones, these would be the colored ones, not the diamond ones. It isn't until um, the Emperor Maximilian gives a diamond that the diamond becomes a bespoke thing. Gemstones, pearl studded garlands, so we like pearls, um, and we like pearls on strings. We like long strings of pearls. We also like putting pearls all over the cloth so that it, it glitters when you move. Silver belts and girdles. I have a friend who's actually done an entire study of girdles of the 16th century. So there's something. The girdle is signaling chastity, and the, the idea of the chastity belt that we bring from our kind of cultural, yeah, there were chastity belts. Actually, mostly they had girdles, and there was that sort of ceremony that was that moment of bedding. And so the display of the girdle becomes part of that celebration of the bedding part of the wedding, which is not something that our movie makers want to pick up on, I suppose, because they're usually thinking about the ratings, right? Additionally, you can have clothing and marriage chests, the chests themselves, the chests with stuff inside. If you haven't been to the Frist, go to the Frist, see the uh, Cassone exhibit. Um, and then overall, Anything could be given as a gift because it's an investment in auspiciousness, which is a word I love. This is an auspicious occasion. We're going to mark it with a gift. And what better gift than song? Because after all, the sumptuary laws are in effect. And we are going to have people coming through the streets telling you that your clothing is too fancy and ripping off the little doodads that you have put on your sleeves. That is not a nice thing, so why not use something that you can have inside the household? And that is where we are going from here. So, gifts. We're going to spend a little time on uh, London Manuscript Royal 8G7. This is a particular songbook that was copied in the early 16th century, just a year or two after Marietta's songbook, just to put it in context. This would not be the uh, <coughs> lower level song repertoire that Marietta is drawing on. This is courtly manuscript. And it's a beautiful book. It has heraldry for King Henry VIII. It has Catherine of Aragon's pomegranates. We're going to look at them. It's the worst drawing of a pomegranate I have ever seen. But I've been told that that is a pomegranate, and I understand that it is a pomegranate, but it looks to me like a rose hip. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the songs in the songbook, Feven's Adjutorium Nostrum, because what that particular song tells us is that it is a lovely manuscript presented to them on the occasion of their wedding that was copied for an entirely different couple. Oops. So here it is. I told you it was lovely. And um, this is the first opening. So folio, sorry, I'll do it over here. Folio 2 verso um, in manuscripts. Uh, when you flipped something over, this is the left-hand side. The verso, that's the right-hand side. And so across the opening, you have the four voices of this particular motet. The first piece in the manuscript 
uh, and we'll look a little, little bit more closely, but I want you to have a chance to really get your eyes on this one because, wow, this is decorated, right? Um, you have a coat of arms up there. That would be for Henry. We'll see it up close. You have the port, uh, the, sorry, I'm going to say it in English, the drawbridge. Um, you have then this. We'll look at that. <clears throat> Looks like a rose hip to me. That's pond of granite. We'll look at it a little bit more closely. And what is this piece? It's in Latin. The rest of it, there are two pieces in Latin right at the start, and then the rest of it's a songbook. And then some dude later in the century comes in and writes a really elaborate piece, which is what everybody wants to tell you about. But it wasn't copied for Henry, so ignore that repertoire. We're just going to stick with the part that's for Henry and Catherine. So what are we doing with the manuscript? On this page, we are visually providing the symbols of the um, marriage of Henry to Catherine of Aragon. So you have Henry's uh, coat of arms. You have a lovely heraldic beast. Um, and there they are holding up the shield. You have down below our pomegranate. There's another pomegranate. Um, you have the Henry's rose. And look at the bottom, down by the tenor part, you have the pomegranate and the rose merged up together. And isn't that the most beautiful wedding gift you have ever seen? It is beautiful, and it is intentionally beautiful. Because it's copied by a guy named, Al well, we call him Alamire. Now, if you know anything <coughs> about Sound of Music, Do a deer, a female deer, ray a drop of golden sun, mi fa so la, la a la. In the medieval way of constructing their scales, you had um, groups of six notes together called hexachords. So you'd run up your scale in six note clusters, and you could name any note in the vocal repertoire based on where you are in this kind of complex. And the pitch A that I sing because I'm female and I'm in a treble register, <clears throat> if it's a C, D, E, F, G, A, and that's not A, I can tell in my head, but I couldn't find C, so there it is. We're going to pretend this is A because I'm medieval and I don't have a reference point. A, it's going to be La if I were singing Do a Deer. It's going to be me if I had started on F, and it's going to be Re if I'd started on G. And so A la mi re, a la mi re, is a particular pitch in this musical schema that becomes the nickname for the major scribe of the 16th century. And you don't know about a la mi re much, probably, but you should, because he copied like 20 of these really elaborate manuscripts like this one. They're beautiful, like they're, they're museum quality objects. They have the important repertoire of his day. So he was like the person who was the go-to person. If you have music that you want to be sure gets passed down in history, make sure that Alamiri and his workshop get a copy of it and put it in a songbook because it will be carefully preserved. None of this goes to wrapping fish carcasses later. Everybody wants to keep it if for no other reason than because it's really pretty. <coughs> and we'll see another example of Alamiri's sort of signature way of copying manuscripts. The first page is always the most ornate. It's where you get the coats of arms. It's where you get the signature piece, right? Alamire is out copying music manuscripts and giving gifts to wealthy patrons across Europe because if you get a gift, you get a commission. And yes, Henry then asks Alamire to copy manuscripts for his friends in Hungary. So I gave you this gift that I was paid for by somebody who's trying to curry favor. Somebody said that earlier. I copied it, you're going to come back to my workshop, give me more money, and give the gift to somebody else. So that network of giving winds up being a very astute financial investment. I also like Alamere because the man ran a spy network. 
Um, and if you're giving manuscripts to wealthy nobles across Europe, and you have the inn in all of these different courts, you actually have sources of information that are not otherwise available. So there's been a good bit of research on Alamiri and his spying practices in the early 16th century. Gifts come with strings attached. There it is. So, Alamiri, beautiful, beautiful handwriting. We love the way the notes shape out. And I am going to move to the next slide and let you look at it for a moment. Then I'm going to play the piece that's here on the first page. Am I in the right one? No, but I'm uh, going to come back to this one. So, put that in your eyes. Four voices. It's in Latin. It's a bit, a uh, little motet. And the motet is actually a prayer for fertility which makes it a really great gift for a wedding. So here is that very first piece that we see. And now all four voices are in. So you have the kind of upper voices and the lower voices, and the text is a, uh, basically a prayer for fertility and plenitude, an auspicious gift for a marriage that did not end particularly well, to be honest. So now I'm going to jump a little bit to the next piece. Let me see if I can, how quickly I can toggle back. You back up? Awesome. So we've seen the joined symbols, we've seen that first motet. The second pair of openings, so actually each of the pieces at the beginning is long enough that it takes two of those openings to copy out all of the music. So here is the start of the second piece in the manuscript. And this gets at some of um, Alamire's signature stylistic things. If you've ever seen one of these on a Christmas card or reproduced on a postcard, they sometimes sell them uh, at the Met. Um, those lovely, lovely scroll work initials, that's Alamire's trademark. Man, those uh, initials, the large ornate initials are just beautiful. And so people loved these manuscripts, even if they didn't have coats of arms at the beginning. They're very distinctive. The notation is lovely. So on this particular piece, we can actually start seeing the evidence <coughs> that the manuscript was not originally intended for Henry and Catherine. And I'm going to actually play, if I can, I'm going to show you this so we can play follow the bouncing green line um, and play through the part where you see Katharina's name, Catherine of Aragon. If you look at the manuscript really closely, what we see is that that's over an erasure. They took out Anna's name. They put in Catherine's name. Because the original couple for whom the book was intended, uh, Louis the, uh, I think it's Louis the 12th and Anna, um, Anna died. That wedding wasn't happening. Now I've got a book where I've put a lot of work into copying it, intended as a royal gift. Who's getting married next in Europe? Ah, Henry and Catherine. And so the book becomes repurposed. And this uh, particular opening shows us how that happens. So here is Adjutorium Nostrum, which is, a, a, again, a motet. It's on a Latin text. It's, again, a motet about fertility and the, the good things that should come from this auspicious marriage. Um, but in this instance, um, the case of which marriage is intended shifts from first compositional intent to received manuscript gift. Set 
of rest for the superiors. interest of my dances. I'm going to cut it off. So go listen to the whole thing because it's gorgeous. So that's Febin. He's a French composer. He's written a motet for the, the kind of uh, productive union of the couple. The names get swapped out. That's fine. Let's toggle back and look at how that's exhibited in the manuscript. I remember it's four-part harmony, um, but each part is copied out separately. Here are the tenor parts, and I actually took both of the pages, uh, both of the openings. Here is the part that was below the superiors that we were just listening to, following the green line, and there it again is Katharina, uh, down towards the bottom of it. And you'll notice here it says it follows along. And so you turn the page, and there is the residual part of the text, the remainder of the motet. And if you go along in that, look over here, there is Henry King, Henry Rex, Henry Cus Rex. And so we've swapped in Catherine and Henry in the motet in place of Lewis and Anne. <clears throat> so this is not a one-off. Wedding gifts of really elaborate songbooks, like this is what my dissertation was supposed to be on, right? Wound up writing on the Florentine things, which is how I know about Marietta, so it was totally worth it. Um, but all of these elaborate gifts that were created for all of these different women at the moment at which they're getting married. And one of the things that I was taught when I was an undergraduate was that all of these books were for men. And yes, Henry's name is in that motet, but darn, his name is on the second page. And nobody ever, ever, talks about what's on the second page of motets. It's always who comes first. There it is, it was Catherine. Um, and so these gifts to these women are important. Here is another, the Melon Chansonnier. This is one that's actually made its way um, to the US. And this manuscript actually has another piece. And then again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to play it. But Belle Accueille, which is a motet by Bunoir, if you remember our lecture on death, you have Dufay, you have Bunoir, you have Akagam. Who's going to lament for the death of Dufay? Bunoir. Um, so you have, he's one of these sort of court musicians in that circle of people we're recognizing as important composers. Bunoir writes a piece that is actually an anagram of Beatrice of Aragon's name. And it's an imperfect anagram, which means that you don't get Belle Accueille, le sergent d'amour. You have to drop out some letters to spell it, but you know, French is hard. So give us a couple of letters, Grace, and it does wind up being her name. And we know that that's intentional because they spell sergent wrong. If you think about the normal spelling, they had to adjust it in order to get you the letters that would fill out her name. So it is essentially putting that lovely B into the hands of Beatrice, who is going off to marry Corvinus of Hungary. Again, one of those betrothal gifts. You get the gift, then you pick up. You go off to a place where you don't actually know the language, except at Matthias's court, Everybody but everybody speaks French, so she was just fine, happily ever afterwards. So giving gifts, it's important, and it's a really nice thing. And giving gifts of music is really cool. So I'm going to take one more example, and then I'm going to move over to our peasants. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that woman that everybody loves to hate, Lucrezia Borgia. You know, the daughter of the poisoning pope? illegitimate daughter of the poisoning popes because popes aren't supposed to be married. Well, it turns out that's not true. In fact, she has a good and uh, solid dad who lives in Spain that nobody talks about. And she comes in and the pope is her uncle. 
But because somebody who is a court tattletale tale teller invented a lovely story about how Lucrezia and her brother were illegitimate and they're a signal of how the papacy has all gone wrong, the one thing we know about Lucrezia is that she is the daughter of the poisoning pope. It isn't true, the poor woman. Um, the other thing we now know about Lucrezia is she couldn't sing worth a darn, but she wanted to because her sister-in-law was Isabella d'Este, like that perfection of Europe, the one who shows up in the book The Courtier, that Isabella d'Este, the one who invented fashion with her siblings, because if you have a new dress every week, people will write about you all over Europe. And if you can sing beautifully, it's great, because you can go out at court and you can sing and you don't want to do it professionally, because Musicians aren't real people, but you can do it just like for fun. And so Isabella, her sister-in-law, is like the singing, dancing, fashion queen. And here comes Lucrezia, um, who is getting married. And Lucrezia really wants to be one with her in-laws. And so what does she get? She gets like the most elaborate wedding of the decade, the gift of music. She gets married in 1502 to Alfonso, Isabella's brother, and for the wedding, they decide that they are going to throw a party. And boy, when the Deste family wants to throw a party, there is no part of the party that remains unthrown um, because the Deste are using their, their conspicu conspicuous consumption to create an aura of being the most important family in Europe. And really, for this period of about seven years, from a musical standpoint, they are. They're the ones who hire Obrecht. They are the ones who bring Josquin down into Italy. Um, they have the whole musical world eating out of their hands, and they're doing really creative stuff, like the idea that you would take Plautus like, yeah, that Plautus, and you translate it into modern Italian so that we can understand it, and then you'd put the plays on at court. But, you know, if you're going to do a bunch of dry Roman comedy, and because it's kind of dry if you don't know all the references, and that makes it a little bit boring, but um, it sort of reminds me of some of the high school literature things we sat through, right? You know you're supposed to love it because it's great work, and oh, you have to work so hard. So if you're going to watch a play, and you're going to work really hard, hard and it's going to go on for like four hours because that's what these things do. What do you do between the acts? You throw a better, better production. Something cool and happening and entremet between the courses and these events become part of the cultural production of Europe and you have tons of people who are involved in putting them together. So the intermedi, these uh, between the scenes pieces, kind of break out and become their own things and you can do a variety of things. You can bring on dancers, you can have acrobats, you can sing songs, you can have instrumentalists, you can bring out cool things disguised as other things, and then all of a sudden do the big reveal. You have, this is the, I'm sorry, I've told you already about that banquet of the oath of the pheasant. There's a tradition of doing this in, in Europe that's a little weird. The 15th century kind of goes off its rocker a little way. We're all going to swear on the bird that we're all going to go off and save Constantinople from the Turks, if somebody else does. Well. You can bring on that there are, there are scenes in which like horses gallop through the, the like play area. Um, and you have costumes and it's very elaborate. So what do we have? Here we have the music of Mantua um, and it's led by Bartolomeo Tromboncino. And I'm going to play some of the music in just a moment because remember I said Lucrezia can't sing very well. Like she's limited range, amateur. She wasn't trained since birth, and Tromboncino is important to that part of the story. But at her wedding, like we pull out all the stops, and so there are five Moreschi. Um, one of them is a horse disguised as a unicorn, right? Faking things is really fun, and along with that, there are four singers and a lute, and they are hidden in the foliage. So out comes the unicorn, and there's this little cart with trees on it, and all of a sudden the trees start singing. 
It was really cool. Everybody was really excited. What did they sing? They sang beautiful songs. Canzone bellissima. And why do we care that they are beautiful songs? Because they are canzone, they are not chanson. Isabella does the chanson thing. What does our friend Lucrezia do? She's not as educated as her sister-in-law. She sings Italian music. For her wedding, what does she get? She gets canzone, not her sister-in-law's chanson, but canzone, written probably by Tromboncino. What was it? We don't know. So I'm just going to play you one of his songs. The other one that I'll just talk about for a moment, because I just love the idea, they, they put silver on an ass's head, made a little statue, essentially. Um, and there was a wind instrument inside. And so if you did something to it, and we don't know what it looked like, but I assume that it was basically like an accordion. So you do something to it. And it makes noise, and then along come two other people, a Turkish drummer and somebody playing an instrument. I have no idea what a zufalo is, but it involves wind um, from the zufa. Uh, but we don't know what it was. So there's like this exotic wind thing and the donkey's head that wind up playing a duet. It just hurts my head. So that's really cool, and it gave people stuff to talk about. Let's look. Um, if you notice the text over here, um, I told you, Lucrez is not particularly sophisticated. Obstinately, I shall pursue my great and noble venture. Love, do your worst to me for even unto death. Obstinately, I shall pursue my great and noble venture. We bring back the same music again and again so she can learn how to sing it. And then it's terrific, so you go on. I think I made my point. Elaborate? No. Fun to sing? You betcha. So what does Lucrezia get out of her wedding? What is the gift that keeps on giving? She gets Tromboncino, who had been working <coughs> at the Deste court, gets picked up and moved into Lucrezia's entourage, where he writes songs called Frotola, um, there are books and books of them in Italy. And Frotola are meant to be these fun little Italian songs that you could sit around and you could sing it with a lute or you could sing it with a couple of other singers. And so Lucrezia is given a composer who's willing to write simple music, good simple music, but simple music. And he joins her staff, so she's always got somebody on call to sing with when she wants. So one of my friends at UCLA, Elizabeth Upton, is actually working on this Lucrezia Borgia story. And she's the one who figured out it wasn't Alexander VI grand, uh, daughter. It was the Spanish kid who comes into this household where the Deste family, the fact that she wins Tromboncino, suggests a certain tension with Isabella, who told the nasty story about Lucrezia's lineage? One of Isabella's historians. Just saying, watch out for those in-laws. <laughs> All right. So I could spend hours and hours and hours on these, but instead we're going to move over. We start, I mean, if you think about it, Lucrezia is actually having her party. Um, but we're going to talk now about some other 16th century parties um, in order to kind of look at some of the evidence that comes down to us. I never can remember where they hide that thing. F5, no. Sorry. Yeah. Who's playing? You got the piffery. The piffery are the wind instruments. A piffery is a pipe. 
Um, and so the piffery are the pipers. And you'll hear them sometimes called piffery and sometimes called stad pfeiffer. They're pipers. A piper is anyone who plays a woodwind instrument. So you have your trumpeters we've talked about. Now we have our wind players. <clears throat> the trumpeters are at least ceremonial people. The piffery are the scum, but they're the good scum. They play these raucous instruments. They are available to play all kinds of things. And they have a great repertoire because the Pifery has figured out how to operate. They have these fairs where you can go learn the repertoire. And so every summer, they get a paid vacation to go learn new songs to keep the court entertained during the winter. And so they pay for income. We talked about this with the trumpeters last time. For example, the uh, commune of Siena sent their instruments off for the trumpeters in Pifri so that they could play at the wedding of one of the local. Again, novels, stories about the period. It is the instruments in Pifori who accompany the bride to the bridegroom's house. We have all these people playing instruments. And so we, we know from the payment records that both Isabella and Lucrezia had woodwind players on their staff. And any woodwind player, it's sort of like a modern pit orchestra for like a Broadway. Um, if you played one in woodwind instrument, you were going to have four or five of them that were in your uh, wheelhouse because you were just expected to play whatever you had. And in this period, you bought your instruments in sets because we don't have standardized tuning. So if you imagine four recorders, and in this town, recorders are pitched here, and in that town, recorders are pitched there, you want to be sure that you're using recorders out of the same set which is why the instruments are generally owned by the town, and the instrumentalists come and use them. So there's your fast introduction to pifri. Pifri are wedding music as it stands. It's sort of like the, the modern, I'm going to hire myself a string quartet. In the 16th century, you went out and you got the pifri to play for your wedding. Um, and I'll just mention this one example as an aside. Um, we also have the idea of the wedding crown. I've mentioned that in the first one. The bride, as she comes out, is often wearing a crown. It's how you know that she's the bride. Um, so let's look at how these things are depicted. Pifri of all sorts, are themselves part of <clears throat> a rustic culture. By rustic, I don't mean that they're actually coming out of the peasantry, but they are articulated thematically as being part of the peasantry. And that's true in, um, it's true in plays, where if you have somebody who comes along playing the bagpipe, they're going to eat an onion, raw, because that's like what you did. Um, and they're probably going to have a pocket that has cheese in it. Um, and if you come up with somebody who is smells of onion and is eating cheese and playing a wind instrument, you can be pretty certain that that is not going to be the upper class represented in the play. So they become sort of stock characters. p are a source of fun, but they are also a source of music making. So let's look at our peasant culture. I want to say, first of all, that this is not a picture of peasants. This is a picture that constructs a view of peasants. There is a difference, right? If I had peasants making pictures of peasants, we might have something different. This is a court or a well-to-do person's commission that says, hey, I want something in that rustic vein. And this is what we get. So, Brugge. These abound. They become a genre, but they had to start somewhere. So we're going to look <coughs> for just a moment at what's in the picture. This one, which is uh, 1567, has a whole bunch of things going on. When in the cycle of the wedding process do you think this is likely taking place? It's the feast. So we've had the betrothal. We've had the bands, presumably. We've had the betrothal. We've now had the wedding. We're having the feast. And what comes after the feast? The bedding. So we are at that moment. And we are constructing the Feast of Cana at a, at a certain level. You've got 
pouring of liquids, but probably beer. Um, you've got abundance of food, but probably porridge. Um, <coughs> lots and lots, <laughs> excuse me, lots and lots of guests. It's a party. So taking it a piece at a time. How do you know who the bride is? She's got a crown. And she also, remember our banners, she has a banner. So there she is. She's seated. If you look at the picture, she's sort of the back part of the triangle. That's the sort of most prominent moment. She's the focus of our attention, even though she's got her eyes closed, her hands clasped, and she's not doing anything. So that's interesting, right? Let's then look at what else is going on. So we have, um, we have our bride. And I wanted to point out that when you do reproductions of pictures, the colors are really inaccurate. So this middle one that's fuzzy, the colors are closer to what they would have been actually in real life. So that's the right color, but it's not a very good reproduction. That's a lot of detail with the big, you can see that the banner has been strung on the wall. You can see the crown. If you look really carefully, it's a paper crown, not a, not a bejeweled crown. You notice that she has a little circlet on her head. And then, um, and that's part of the cap, and it's got little doodads probably little bits of stone uh, sewn in. And there she is, hands clasped, silently, not eating anything. She's the only one who doesn't have food at the moment because she's in that state of sanctity. Everyone else is having the party. She's just been blessed. She's sort of in that afterward of the blessing, getting ready for the third part of the event that's unfolding. Who else? Well, we've got lots and lots of things going on. It's fun to be at parties. They have really good food. I mentioned that that's probably beer. Um, later on, we have another part of the picture. I love this because I think this is why we think it's beer. She's got a beer stein, and it's a, an area that produces beer, so the beer makes sense. And we know that beer was purchased by the, uh, by the tonnage, by the um, large um, multi-gallon container for weddings. So beer makes sense. And you have the little kid down there who's just going away, eating the food with a finger. Love that. <clears throat> so other people are eating. They're drinking. They're asking for seconds. You have then guests. And the guests themselves in this picture are important people. You get the dude with a chair. He's the only one with a chair. Everyone else is on benches. He's got a high back chair. Why? Because he's the notary. He is the official observer who has had to sign the document that says that this marriage took place on this day. Um, if uh, they were wealthy enough, he also would have been the person to first work with them verbally to get the details of the contract and then would have written out the contract, which would be filled with legal gobbledygook. It's amazing. Reading notary documents is <clears throat> a really good cure for insomnia filled with phrases you see in every single document. So he gets his chair, he has on his cap, he's kind of eyeing the food actually when you look at the full picture. He's like, why don't I have mine yet? Um, kind of like that about him, kind of a grumpy guy. Um, then you have the Franciscan. So randomly we have somebody monastic attending as one of the wedding guests. Could be a, a member of the family because, of course, younger sons are going into the monastic orders at this time. And then you have rich guy. Rich guy at a peasant wedding, possibly a reproduction of the, or a, a representation of the landlord, possibly also a representation of the person who commissioned this picture because, again, you give something to get something, right? And uh, then you have the variety of activities going on at our parties. Um, I, that could be bread, but it looks to me like a chicken wing. Just really does. Um, and you have something else going on. You have your pifri. And I love these pifri because one thing, you've got, the two, you've got two drones, so we know that it's kind of an elaborate bagpipe that he's playing. And if you look carefully, next to him is young dude. So I mentioned that you learn your instruments, monkey see, monkey do. I suspect that little young guy 
playing the two drone instrument is the second bagpiper in a, a father-son or in a master-apprentice relationship. So two bagpipes, the pifuri, to play the music. <clears throat> and there's the whole thing again. So what is that like? I'm going to, I promised dancing. Here's my dancing. So we don't know what these dances are like. Peasants' uh, dances were not recorded, but we do know some of the music, and we do know some of the things about the music. The Soltarello, for example, is a jumping dance um, from Saltari. <laughs> dances. We know from stories, from romances, from poems, from references, from depictions, circle dances were things you did at weddings. So Saltarello, Saltarellos go back to the, the earliest copy we've got in music, goes back to late 14th century, and that one is it. That's the first one ever copied down. One of my favorite pieces of music, so I wanted to play it, but I also thought they did a nice job just to be clear. They made up what they were doing with their feet, but we know that certain kinds of jumping steps were part of the Saltarello because that's what a Saltarello means. And in fact, um, the other kind of dance that we get in this period um, that is appropriate is something that was called a brawl. Not that kind of brawl. A branle uh, in French. The French branle um, is again a circle dance. <laughs> do dancing in a circle. We know 16th century dances are lots of stepping. They're not like the dances of the Baroque period where you had to be trained. You walk or you step sideways and you could do things like grapevines and you could do little kick, kick, kicks to show that you were really special. Hold on a sec. What? No, this is participatory dance. And so uh, anyone at court um, might gather up in a garden and do a dance. It's sort of what you did because you didn't have TV. Uh, you dance things. When you read references to carols, we think about Christmas. They thought about dancing because a carol was actually one of these circle dances. And they were um, carols are repetitive so that you get a lot of music, but you are able to do these kind of simple steps. And the more sophisticated you are, the more you can do your cha-cha-cha kind of dance steps. So these kinds of dances, saltarellos, carols, brawls, these are dances that you would have done at weddings because everybody loves the chicken dance, right? You grab somebody and you start a circle and you move it around and everybody has fun together using the music in the background of these instrumentalists who've been trained by ear. We know a little bit about what they're doing because one of the six, well, three of the 16th century dancing masters wrote instructional man manuals. Uh, Negri and Arbo in particular like talking about these sort of simple dances to explain why their dances are so much better. So we get the peasant backdrop, 
as uh, sort of, and the peasants do this, and then our sophisticated people do things that include walk this way, and then walk backwards, and then move over here, my partner's headed that way, and then we'll come back to the center, and we'll pass behind one another, and then we'll come back to the center, and then we'll do the little footy thing, and then we'll turn around, which is really sophisticated, and it's really cool, and you've had a dancing master, and that's why you should pay him. Um, so, dancing as a part of the wedding ceremony is a standard thing. Remember last time we talked about uh, Zorsi Trompeta, that guy who was on the boat with his friend the Sham player playing gigs? Well, here's an arrangement of a German song that we think was probably part of, again, wedding repertoire. Zorsi was off in the Greek area. This is German and, and so close to our Dutch friends. Heldren, it's really dancing music, right? You can tell it's got that beat to it. It's got the regularity. It's got the really kind of sounds like a kazoo nasal instrument going on. Very medieval. And the phrases, you can sort of tell there are easy places where I can stop my video, as opposed to some of the other song repertoire where it just kind of oozes from section to section to section. Dances are meant to be fairly straightforward. So where does that take us at the end of the day? We have a ton of representations. Uh, I'm just going to sort of flip through. ton of representations of these peasant weddings. And the reason we've got them is that they were popular. They were selling. Because Bruegel, who'd started, he'd, he'd trained up through the apprentice system, went off to Italy and studied for a while. He came back. He was working, doing print drawings. You know, it paid pretty well. And then he started painting. And the money started rolling in. It's always follow the money, right? So he moved. He'd been in Antwerp. He moved off um, to Brussels, where he had more access to more capital. And he paints these like they're a dime a dozen. And I'm just going to take this last minute. I'm going to overwhelm you. And then I promise this time I'll remember to mail my PowerPoint. You can go back to these. But I think this emerging genre of peasants having fun as a representation of what good times could be are really kind of a nice gift to us from this period. We know from commissions that sometimes these are intended for households, right? You want to have these pictures of happy people doing happy things because there are a whole array of happy things and happy times. And everybody loves a party. So thank you. Next time we're going to talk about the greatest party, or at least the most documented party, of the 16th century. I told you at the first day of class, the festival book becomes a thing. So we have, on the one hand, our peasant pictures. Now we're going to move to court and see what you can do when you've got the whole publishing industry behind you. Have a good week, and I'll see you next time.